Aren't you thankful that it didn't just stop on Friday when they laid him in a tomb? He told them in three days that he'd raise it back up. And he did, and it was triumphant. And because the power that resurrected Jesus Christ will resurrect us one day. 
when we hear that glorious trumpet in the sky, and we're going to meet all those that have gone on before us. Dead in Christ shall rise first, and those of us that remain shall be called up with them together. And I'm just so thankful for that, and I'm looking forward to that day. Let's just love him one more time. Jesus, we love you today. We're so thankful, Lord, that you shed that precious blood for each and every one of us that are here today, Lord Jesus, that are under the sound of my voice. Lord, we're thankful, Lord, that you took the stripes, Lord, that you took the beating, Lord, that you took the punishment of the cross, Lord Jesus, that we could have life and that we could have it more abundantly. And we're just so thankful for that. We're thankful, Lord, that you rose again that you are alive, that we serve the one true living God in the precious name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in Jesus' name. You may be seated. We'll ask Samuel to come and take our offering. And so if you have your uh, Save Our Children offering, please drop that in, your tithe and your general expense offerings. We'd appreciate that. So thankful that we get to celebrate our risen Savior today. Amen. I'm so thankful that we are able to come together and worship him for what he has done for each and every one of us. He's been so good to us. Just as the song says, all my days, he's been faithful. And he will continue to be faithful. And I'm just so thankful for that. Aren't you thankful that we don't have to put our hope in this world? Amen. Amen. We have hope that is eternal. We have hope in Jesus Christ that he, he promised that he'd come for us. And we're looking for that glorious day. And I'm just so thankful for that. I'm also thankful for a pastor Amen. that preaches the word. I'm thankful for a pastor that loves the people of the church. That he cares about each and every one of us. And so we want to give him plenty of time on this Resurrection Sunday. And so, Brother Bauer, come and tell us what the Lord has laid upon your heart today. I'm going to read Matthew chapter 28. Verses 5 through 7. All the material there is good. You can read that on your own time. Who's thankful for the resurrection? Amen. Keely, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What a promise we have. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not, unto the women, fear not, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. You may be seated. I want to talk to us for just a little while. On the question, where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? As Jesus died on the cross, darkness fell across the land. That evening, a rich follower of Jesus named Joseph of Arimathea took possession of Jesus' body. They wrapped Jesus' lifeless corpse in a long, clean sheet and placed it in a new tomb recently carved out of rock. As Mary Magdalene and another Mary watched, a large stone was rolled across the entrance. You see, those that were against Jesus, who believes that we live in a world that's against Jesus? The reason for that is uh, one of the apostles, it may have been John, I can't remember, uh, one of them said, the spirit of Antichrist is at work in our day. The spirit of Antichrist is at work in our day. And they thought that they had finally taken care of their problem. We have Jesus out of the picture now, but we want to make sure 
that he's out of the picture. Well, we're afraid somebody's going to come and steal his body. Well, what was the big deal about that? We don't want people to have hope in Jesus. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to seal it up real good. We, we took care of him, and we're going to seal it up and make sure that no one can get to him. And on top of that, we're going to place guards there. That's what happened. The next day, the priest responsible for Jesus' crucifixion went to see Pilate. Sir, we think Jesus' followers will steal Jesus' body and then tell everyone that he was raised from the dead. Will you please seal the tomb? Pilate agreed to seal the tomb and sent extra guards. Early on Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene and another Mary returned to the tomb to apply spices to Jesus' body. Suddenly, a great earthquake erupted as an angel rolled aside the stone that covered the tomb. The angel perched atop the stone door as the guards below fainted. Brother Rich, I don't think these guys were windy. I think these guys were straight up killers. But the, what was going on was so magnificent. These manly Roman soldiers fainted as this earthquake began to happen. And the angels was there. And the angel's face shone bright white and his clothing was white as snow. As the women cowered, the angel declared, Don't be afraid. I know you seek Jesus who was crucified, but he is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Amen. Come look where his body was lying. The women saw that the tomb was indeed empty. The angel continued, Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. He will meet you in Galilee. Now go. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were frightened, but also filled with great joy. You ever been in a state like that where you were frightened, but also at the same time filled with joy? They rushed to give the disciples the incredible news. What was that news? Jesus lives. Jesus lives. We talked about this the other night at our gathering, but it's strange when we read the Gospels and, and John, I believe it was John where Jesus came to them multiple times after the resurrection. And it, it seemed like everything he tried to do, they just couldn't comprehend the resurrected Savior. I believe, I, I don't know that I have any proof that I can put my finger on but the reason I believe that is because they had seen Jesus, they had seen his miracles they seen his power and everything that he could do but when they seen the cross Sister Shelley, when they seen the brutality that he suffered as a man and then he died it was ultimate finality in their mind, they thought this is it, even that's when Peter said I'm going to go back fishing. Yeah. It was so brutal, so bleak that they couldn't comprehend. But Jesus is alive. I don't care how bad your situation is. I don't care what the circumstance is. I don't care what you got going on or what the devil's trying to tell you. We have hope in Jesus Christ because Jesus lives. I like how the lesson, it, every, time, every lesson it has a little statement that says truth about God in all caps. This lesson, truth about God, semicolon. Jesus lives. Say it with me. Jesus lives. He is alive. To any other man, death would have been the end of their story just as the disciples and everyone else that watched as this tragic event of the cross happened. Any other man, it would have been the end of their story. We know from living in social atmospheres that there are 
different uh, trains of thought and religions and beliefs that people have. One that's powerful that we know of is one called Islam. And their religion is based from the prophet Muhammad. I, you know, I'm going to say this and I might get... I might get crucified for saying it, but in a lot of these religions, there's good things that you can find in them. But it's not Jesus. The prophet Muhammad uh, was the father of Islam and the way it started is he said that I just held the quill or the pen, if, you, if we can say that, I just held it as Allah wrote the words and as the Quran became into existence. But Muhammad lived from 570 to 632 AD. He was somewhere around 61 to 62 years old and Muhammad died. There was a man named Confucius. He was a long time ago, 551 to 479 B.C., People still follow his sayings to this day. From his teachings came the thought that is called the hundred schools of thought. But guess what? Confucius lived and Confucius died. And they have him still in a tomb. There's someone called Siddhartha if I'm saying his name right, Siddhartha Gautama. But more popularly known as the Buddha. I, I kind of look like the Buddha. I'm a little bit more Buddha than he is. <laughs> the Buddha means the awakened or the enlightened one. But he only lived from 536 to 480 B.C. He lived a long time. He lived 80 years old. But Brother Chris, then he died. And they have him in his shrine. And his body is still there. Now I just threw this one in for good measure. Just so that we could have a, a, a foundation to build from here. There was a man named Anton LaVey. Does anybody know who that is? He was born Howard Stanton LaVey. He was the founder of the Church of Satan. I want to pause right here and just say that contradicts itself. Because church, the word church in the Bible means called out. Satan doesn't want anyone called out. He wants them blended in and, and fitting in with everything. So the church of Satan is a contradiction in its own name. And Anton LaVey founded this and I, I thought this was very interesting. Anton LaVey, he, he was in some movie stuff and did different things, narratives and stuff. And when you look at his picture online, he looks kind of dramatic. He died on October 29th, 1997 at the age of 67. Now here's what I thought was interesting. Two days from Halloween. The devil couldn't even keep him alive long enough that he might have some kind of glorious departure. <laughs> right, Brother Chris? I mean, it could have been dramatic, but no, and I don't... I, I don't have nothing against Halloween. I'm just saying he could have dressed up like the devil and went off. And <laughs> the devil couldn't keep him alive for two days. All of these prophets, that's about like him. And he just comes up a dollar short. It looks good when he promises it, don't it? All of these prophets, teachers, all of them said, follow me. And I will show you the way. Hundred schools of thought, enlightened one. Antoine LeVay. Follow me. I'll show you the way. But Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, Follow me. Come and follow me. 
And I'll make you fishers of men. And he didn't say, I'll show you the way. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I'm not going to show you truth. I'm not going to reveal truth to you. He can do that. But he said, I am truth. And I am the life. Yes, amen. Jesus, when they were asking him about the resurrection, trying to catch him and, and, and hang him up, they asked him about the resurrection and how it all worked. And he told them something along the lines, you always, you always err not knowing the scriptures. But he, said, he reminded them how God said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And what he was telling them is, there is an afterlife. And Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, God said, I am, present tense, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Listen to what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's telling us I am alive when he says that. He's alive right now. He's alive in the deepest, darkest valley that you're going to be in. Our Savior is alive. They tried to seal him up. They tried to shut him up. But the grave burst open and Jesus come out and he said, I'm not done yet. Jesus' death on the cross was simply the next chapter in a story still being told 2,000 years later. They've, they've tried to change this, I believe, now. But the way that we keep time here, at least in the United States, always revolved around before the birth and after the birth of Jesus Christ. When Jesus rose from the dead, He fulfilled prophecy and permanently changed the trajectory of all people's relationship with God. Before Jesus came, God was, even though God had always desired Him, He always had a plan. But before Jesus came, there was a gap between the divine and humanity because of the fall of mankind but God because he is so rich in mercy he said I'm going to speak a language that you understand I know you understand humanity and so God made himself humanity and came and walked among us to bridge that gap and died and shed blood to forgive us of our sins and he was resurrected in power and glory. Because Jesus claimed ultimate victory over anything that could come against us, we can boldly enter into the presence of God. Jesus said, fear not, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, fear not, I am the first and I am the last. I am He that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. He amens Himself. And I have the keys of hell and of death. I want someone to get it in your spirit today. We have victory through Jesus Christ. No, you're not good enough. No, I'm not good enough. I don't have enough resources. I'm not powerful enough. But Jesus is. He gave us the victory. He won it all those years ago. New King James. Now the works of the flesh are evident. King James says manifest. Now the works of the flesh are revealed. Which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, 
selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries. Revelries is a, some translates that, wild party. I won't tell you what some of the others translates that as. As I told you in time past, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I read that because I want you to see this. Now the works of the flesh. Why do you work, Brother Robert? To be compensated, right? The works of the flesh brings a wage. For the wages of sin, this is the amplified version, for the wages which sin pays is death. But the bountiful free gift of God, it's a gift. There's a difference. There's the works of the flesh and then there's the gift of God which is eternal life. In union with Jesus Christ, our Lord. Brother Robert brought this up the other night. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Brother Chris, I like how he said this. I feel like he's putting the cherry on top of it. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again to receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. But here's the part I really like. He said, if it were not so, if it was anything else than that, I would have told you. Why? Because I am the way, the truth, and the life. But I'm going to prepare a place, and if I go, I'm coming again to receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Matthew 28, 19, he said, go baptize, make disciples. And he gave them a promise. He said, lo, I am with you. He didn't say always. He said, I am with you all way. There's only one way. I am with you all way, even to the end. Anyone feel like they're at the end of their rope today? I am with you always, Jesus said. I'm going to take him at his word at you. He said if it was something else, I would have told you. But I'm coming again. I'm thankful for the resurrection promise that Jesus gives. Jesus lives. Have I already gone longer than 20 minutes? It's not 1130 yet. I'm still doing good. I usually don't get done until 1230. Knowing that Jesus is alive and working within us, our faith should rise up and we should do incredible things for Him. Because He rose again and lives in us, we have hope for tomorrow and also His power to cope with fear. I didn't know who sang this but I was looking at this lesson. And I guess it must have been Bill Gaither. I just remember my grandma singing it. They must have been Gaither fans back then. Life is worth the living just because He lives. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. But the lesson points out that that lyric should also probably say this, because He lives, I can face today. Who has found that He's an ever-present help in our time? Of need. Because Jesus claimed the ultimate victory again over anything that could come against us, we can boldly enter into God's presence. True or false? This test is too hard. Sister Dunn, you were a school teacher. This test is too hard. When I when I took that B test, y'all remember how I was sweating over that? 
The instructor said, who here thinks they're going to fail? And I raised my hand. He said, remove all doubt from your mind. Remove that right now and you'll do fine. This test is too hard. I know I will fail and I will never achieve my goals. False. I will never lose hope because Jesus rose from the dead. True. True or false, the situation I'm in right now is so bad, I don't think things will ever be good again. True or false, I will never lose hope because Jesus rose from the dead. True or false, they are sick and the doctor even said it's hopeless. I should give up. True or false, I will never lose hope because Jesus rose from the dead. Can I get a witness as I think back over my life? I can state beyond the shadow of a doubt that I am blessed. Amen. When I would start to think these false thoughts, I know this seems simple, but we all have been in places where we think, man, the bad is always, and it's never going to be good again. It's hopeless. That's the devil trying to seal Jesus up, keep you from seeing him. But I promise you, Jesus is going to roll that stone away. I am reminded about the sacrifice Jesus made for me on that cross. And then I am reminded that even death itself could not hold him down. On the third day, I'm thankful for the cross and I'm thankful for the blood. But I'm also thankful for an empty tomb. That Jesus said, I'm not going to stay here. I'm not going to stay down. You see, if He did that, we would be a defeated church. But He didn't do that. He rose again, just as He said. Amen. On the third day, He rose in victory and power and glory. And because of that, I will never lose hope. True, true, true. Jesus focused verses of our lesson. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building. And wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. First Corinthians chapter 15, 52, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it's faster than that. Did you hear me? It's faster than that. At the last trump, and that's not Donald Trump, I don't believe. I told Caitlin that. I don't believe it's Donald Trump. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. I'm going to close with the little thought I had as soon as I looked at this lesson. 46 years we spent building this temple. We tend to think that, man, to reach my, my goals and my dreams of living for God, it's a long process. I don't know who I'm preaching to. I don't know anything about your life other than what I may have heard in conversation or whatnot. I don't know anything. But I can't tell us this. Jesus can change your life. In a moment. I wish... I, you can understand. I know that we say it. You don't know like I know what he's done for me. But in one moment, I was a hopeless drug addict sinner that had done things that you could not be forgiven for. My family had turned their back on me. People had given up on me. I was headed towards a place no one wants to go. And in a moment... Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, change my life. Jesus, pick me up out of the miry clay that had clinged to me, had me stuck. Now, scarred hands reached down in a moment and picked me up and put my feet on 
on a rock to stay. Where is Jesus? If we will obey the gospel, that gift that we talked about, where is Jesus? He's in us. He's inside of His church. No matter where we might be. I'm not going to church today. I am the church today. I am the church. He's inside the body of believers. The body of Christ. Jesus is alive inside of us. Outside of Easter... As we live out this message year round, this truth should become evident to everyone we meet. Look for ways to remind your kids God is with you and His Spirit is living inside of you. He is alive, guiding and comforting. Anybody need comfort today? Amen. Comforting us through life in this process called discipleship. He is alive. And all of His promises found in the Bible are for us. He is alive. And He wants to show the whole world how He is alive in us. Stand with me. I don't understand. Now we're going to do a little thing today after church. We won't take a long time. But when I think about the traditions of our celebratory things that we do. We all in here probably have different loved ones or family members even that. Uh, we, we feel that they are asleep in Christ. They live faithfully for God and they have gone on now to meet their reward. But here's what I don't understand about our tradition. We usually go visit their graves uh, and, and decorate and, and remember them on what used to be called Decoration Day or Memorial Day. And I know that's for veterans, but we... We do that for family members and things too. But really, us as Christians, around the time of Easter, we should visit these family and loved ones with our family and remind each and every one because Jesus lives. We have a promise. Of a resurrection. In the moment. In the twinkling of an eye. We shall all. Be changed. The apostle Paul would end his thought with. Comfort one another. With these words. What was Paul saying? In this life as Jesus said. In this life there will be tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Let's raise our hands. Can we envision all the promises that are held in the resurrection? I'm going to get to see Jesus one day. I'm going to get to see my grandma and grandpa again one day. My grandma's not going to have diabetes anymore. My grandpa's not going to have heart disease anymore. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, with all of our hearts, let's thank Him. Thank you, Jesus.